If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. I'm going to talk to you about today um, over the last course of our series together on who you are, who are you. We've been talking about being the redeemed. And what I want to talk to you about today is when the redeemed sin greatly. When the redeemed sin greatly. Have you ever sinned greatly? Have you ever messed up? Have you ever had a season where you've sinned greatly? I tell you this, with all my heart, you're sons of the living God, the redeemed of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who are moving toward this, on this journey toward Christ and Christ likeness. And sometimes on that journey, we mess up, we fall. We struggle, we hurt, we find ourselves in places that we know we ought not be. And let me just say this, falling greatly is relative. <laughs> falling, falling greatly is relative. We think about, we, when we think about people falling greatly, we think about in terms of, of some sexual sin or some adulterous affair. I'm going to tell you this, um, walking in untruth for a season is, is falling greatly. Really, really, really important to understand this. We're the redeemed. We're the redeemed of God. We're sons of the living God. And we have in this passage of Scripture a man that we know as Peter, Simon Peter. Jesus looked at him one day when he first met him and said, you're Simon, but now you're going to be Peter. You're going to be a rock. And the rock's going to come three years later and sin greatly. He is going to mess up. He's going to deny him. He's going to even deny Jesus. We're going to see in just a moment. That he even knows Jesus. He's going to say, no, I don't know him. And he's going to sin greatly in this passage of Scripture. And the question that we want to ask is, is what happens when the redeemed sin greatly? And when, what happens when they fall? What, where is God in all that? What is God up to? What is God doing? Jesus has been arrested he was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was betrayed by Judas. The folks, uh, the, the, the disciples have scattered, but Peter has followed Jesus to the court. He's followed Jesus to the high priest. In verse 57 of, of Matthew 26, it says, Those who had seized Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were gathered together. And Peter, but Peter was following him at a distance, as far as the courtyard of the high priest. And he entered in and he sat down with the officers to see the outcome. Now, let's just say this. John, John has not denied Christ, right? Okay? Everybody else is scattered. And, Jesus, and, and, and Peter, Peter is at a distance. He's, he's at a distance from the Lord. Okay? And they're walking in fear. They're walking in worry. They're walking in anxiety. There's a very critical moment. And I, I, I want to just say for all that we'll talk about Peter today is, is that, man, I, he... I think just in this season, in this moment, it's like he got as close to Jesus as he could get at that point because of fear, worry, stress. So he sits down in this courtyard and um, somebody questions him. Notice verse 69. Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard and a servant girl came to him and said, you too were with Jesus the Galilean. Verse 70, but he denied it before them all, saying, I, I do not know what you are talking about. And when he'd gone out to the gateway, okay, so he gets farther from Jesus, right? He, he's, he's in the courtyard, but now he goes to the gateway. When he'd gone out to the gateway, another servant saw him, a servant girl saw him and said to those who were there, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he died it, denied it, watch this, with an oath. I do not know the man. Notice, he's in the courtyard, courtyard. He is sitting in the fire. There's offers around. He's wanting to know the, in, uh, uh, want the, out, know the outcome. And you know what? In some, in some ways, he's just minding his own business until a little girl comes up and says, hey, you're one of them. 
And he denies it. I'm not. And he gets up from that, he goes to the gateway, and then another girl says, hey, I, hey, he's not saying it to him, he's saying it to everybody around. Hey, this guy was with Jesus of Nazareth. I want you to notice the progression here. It's the progression of sin. I don't know him. I don't know him. And then the next thing you know, he's denying it with an, an oath. Again, he denied it with an oath. I, I don't know the man. And then a little later, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, surely you, are too, you too are one of them, for even the way you talk gives you away. You talk like a Galilean. You got an accent just like them. I spoke yesterday at a retreat, and a um, guy said, came up to me and says, I, I can hear a little New Orleans in you. What part of New Orleans are you from? So I'm from Metairie. So if I really sounded like that, I'd say Metri. <laughs> I'd say it in that kind of thing. And, you know, I, I, I kind of thought, I said, you know, you know I'm from New Orleans. You know my brother. I was at my brother's retreat. He said, but I heard a little New Orleans in you. It gave away, sometimes it gave away by my accent. Sometimes they ask me if I'm from New York, Lisa. <laughs> Bronx, you know, because we talk a little bit like that. But what he said and how he said it, how he was talking, gives him away. He said, you sound like you're from this district. And so we know that you're one of them because you know, some people have seen you with them. And now you're even, even your voice gives you away, the way you talk. And then he began to curse and swear, I do not know the man. Now watch this. And immediately the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the word which Jesus has said, before a rooster crows, you will have denied me three times. And he went out and he wept bitterly. Peter, the rock, falls. And in some form or fashion, we have all found ourselves fallen. Why is that? Listen, you are redeemed. You have a new nature. You're the son of the living God, daughters of the living God. You have everything that you need. You're righteous in Christ, but you are still fallen. And I, I just want to say, I, I just believe that even though Jesus said, well, I'm, I'm not going to say it that way. I look at you, I look at us, and I look at us as the redeemed, and I, I think that, that knowing that we're redeemed, and knowing that we're sons of the living God, and knowing where we're heading can go a long way from preventing the fall. You know, a couple of weeks ago we talked about David, and we, we talked about that great verse of Scripture, no oh, temptation is, is overtaking you, but which is common to man, and God is faithful, will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but will take with the temptation, he'll give, you, he'll give you a way of escape so that you may be able to endure it. I, I kind of think that Peter had an a, a, a out. And I'm going to tell you this, whatever temptation you're in today, you have an out. We've been talking about this whole thought of being redeemed by God. And, you know, I want to talk to you a little bit more about that today. Because I believe that we need to believe the redemption work of God in our lives. And when we're believing the redemptive work of God in our lives, and according to Galatians chapter 4, that we're no longer slaves to sin, and that we're sons and daughters of God, having been redeemed, that we, it goes just a long way about just remembering who we are that says, no, I'm not going to walk that way. I'm not going to deny him. I know him. I know him. I'm not going to deny him by my lips, and I'm not going to deny him by my actions because there's a ton of people who might say yeah put it on your Facebook I'm a believer I'm a Christian I, I, I stand for God and yet you live like the devil with our lips we honor him but our heart is far from him Denial is more than just saying, I don't believe in Jesus. It's the way sometimes we live that says, really? You, you believe in him? But I, you know, listen, I, I'm, I'm saying this as a, as, a, as a people who would just continue to walk, continue to walk. But listen, if you've got Jesus in your life, you've been redeemed from that. You've been redeemed from that kind of lifestyle. 
And when I come to believe that and I come to put my faith and trust in that, you know what happens? Fruit becomes, comes out of my life and I stop living that way because I know who God is and I know he's redeemed me and he's called me redeemed and he's called me a son, a chip off the whole block. <laughs> Think about that, to look and act like our heavenly Father. This is part, this is part, part of the, the, the salvation work of God. And he says, listen, you have been redeemed. And I think, I think if Peter can remember that, I think Peter one day will remember that. You're no longer, you're no longer a slave. You're a son and daughter, you've been redeemed. You've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, Peter says. And in that redemption, you have forgiveness of sins. He has forgiven you of your sins. I want, to, I want you to keep your place here and go to Psalm chapter 40. Uh, Psalm chapter 40, this is a great picture of redemption, of being redeemed. Verse 1, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and he heard my cry. Where, where was he patiently waiting for the Lord? And where did, he, where did he cry out to God? He cried out to God in the pit. The pit of destruction. Feet in the miry clay. The quicksand. He's sinking in the pit. That's where he is. And he needs a redemptive work of God. And the redemptive work of God is this. I waited patiently for the Lord. I, you know what he's saying is, I know God's coming. I know he's moving. I know he's going to take, he's going to do this. I incline my, I, I, I speak to him. He hears my cry. He inclines to me. And then he brought me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay. And he set my feet upon a rock, making my footsteps firm. And guess what else he did? He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see in fear and will trust in him. What pit is he talking about? He, I, I don't know. He may, be, he may be talking about the pit of destruction he found himself as we talked about two, two weeks ago when, when he sinned with Bathsheba and killed her husband. But he's in the pit and he's waiting for God. And I, I, I thought about this the other day. I, I thought about when God pulls you out of the pit, he pulls you out of the pit. You don't crawl out scratching. He reaches in and he pulls you out. And he puts you on the rock. And the rock is Jesus. And it's a new life, a new song in your heart and mouth that you sing and you praise, and give praise unto our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's a new life. You're no longer in the pit. You're no longer sink, sinking. You're on the rock, Jesus. And there's something new happening. And guess what, folks? This newness never, ever stops. There's no end, the Bible says, to the increase of his government in your life. No end to the increase of peace. And the question is, is I, I want to get to a place, I want to I get, I, I get to a place, and the question is, are you at a place where you're believing that today? That God has so much more for us. Even when we find ourselves fallen. Even when we find ourselves making the mistake, waking up into the pit of destruction. Let me tell you, when you have this overall belief in who God is, what God's doing, how God's working in your life, and you know that you've been redeemed from God and that you've been redeemed through his blood and then you've been, you've been purchased by him, um, by the blood of Jesus, that you belong to him, that you're under his authority, you're under his care, you're under his kingdom, not under the world, not under the enemy anymore, but under God. And then you realize he's forgiven me of all my sins. And he removes the shame, and he removes the guilt. Yesterday, I spoke to 80 men in my brother's ministry down in Glen Rose. And I just pretty much literally preached the message I preached to you two weeks ago on God delivering us from guilt and shame. And I had the opportunity to walk three men through deliverance, three different kinds of sinful stuff they've been dealing with. And then also one guy who's been dealing with guilt and shame for the last 14 years. 
He sat down with me and he said to me, you know, I just want you to know, I've got a good marriage, always have been faithful. It's not about, about what David did. And then he began to talk to me and, I, and I, I, I wish I could tell you the whole story right now because I didn't call him and ask for permission. But 14 years ago, he was in a situation where anger and wrath and malice came out of his life. And uh, when he sat down, he said to me, I've been living with this 14 years. And I said, do you believe that God wants to forgive you and release you? And matter of fact, as we talked about, that he's already done that. He said, yeah, but I just, I can't, I just can't receive it. And so this is what I did. And I just, you know, there's, there's those, those moments in that counseling time, in those moments in that time, you just, you know, God just kind of leads you to do something. And I just said, and he's a big strapping guy, you know, military guy. And, um, and I said, I want you to bow your head and I want you to hold your hands out like this. And I said, and I said, I want you to, I, I, I really, I, I want to lead you in a prayer. <laughs> and this guy, I, I, I said something like, oh, Lord, you are my God and my Savior. You, you saved me. Lord, would you forgive me for the anger, the wrath, the malice? He could not say it. He could not speak it. He, he was so emotionally, he was so overwrought with emotion, but he couldn't say it. And, um, and so I just waited there, and, uh, and 20 seconds passed by, and another 20, and then, you know, in 20 seconds when you're in that kind of situation, it seems like five minutes, right? But I'm just waiting. And finally, he says, would you forgive me for the anger and the malice and the rage that I walked in in those days and for the result of that anger and rage? And then I said, and so he, he prayed and I said, Lord, I receive your forgiveness that whoever the sun sets free shall be free indeed. And he repeated it. And then we said amen and he stood there. And you know, usually this is what happens. He goes, Whew. and we get to talking and he goes, he looks at me, he says, hey, I'm free. He, this is what he said. I just looked for it and couldn't find it. I just now looked for it, and I can't find it. It's not there. I just looked for that anger. I just looked for that sadness. I just looked for that guilt. I just looked for that shame. I'm looking for it because it's been a part of my life for 14 years, but it's gone. Yeah, it's gone. So I think I can fly. So we're on a cliff here. Don't try to do that yet, okay? <laughs> but I know what you're saying. Freedom. God, would you forgive me? This is a part of the redemptive work of God. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I wanna say this. This is what um, Peter will one day write. We were redeemed from our futile way of life, not with, not with gold or sil silver, but with the, with the precious blood of the Lamb. And he's talking about that by the power and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but he's also speaking that about his life and his experience. I know what it's like to be redeemed. I know what it's like to have fallen and to fall royally and to fall on my face. I know what it's like, but I also know what it's like to be redeemed. And I, I just want to say this, when you're in the middle of the temptation, when you're in the middle of the anger or just about to be angry and go to the next level, and you're in the middle of that lustful thought and it's going to the next thing because that's what happens. We begin to, th the enemy tempts us, it gets into our mind, we begin to think about it and then we nurture it. You got to stop it. You can't nurture it. But if you nurture it, you'll do it. And then you'll do it and if you'll keep doing it, it'll become a habit. And if it becomes a habit, it becomes the destruction piece of your life. And you can say no to it by the grace of God. By walking in the redemptive work of God and what God said he did at the cross for you 2,000 years ago. Listen, redemption is not just about being forgiven and set free of the past. It's about walking in freedom in your future. It's the redemptive work of God. So Peter falls, right? But he's gonna learn what it really means to be pulled out of the pit. And it's just a great, a great story. It's a great story of redemption and restoration. 
And I just think that, you know, you got to get to this place where you humbly receive the work of God's redemption in your life and don't wait three weeks, six weeks, or 14 years, or don't even wait, wait another day. God is available to pick you up right now out of the pit so you don't, no longer, uh, 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 you no longer just waller in the mire. Humbly receive the work of God's redemption in your life. It's what he's done. Now, now no, notice again, 75, verse 75, back in Matthew 27, Peter, Peter, remember the word which Jesus has said. He said this, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and he wept bitterly. He remembered. He remembered. What did he remember? Turn to Luke chapter 22, if you would. Luke chapter 22, because folks, we need to be a people that remembers to remember who he is, to remember who we are, to remember what the word says about redemption, about forgiveness, about renewal. Because I'd say this, there, we said this a couple of weeks ago, there's some of us in here that keep beating ourselves up and beating ourselves up over the things that have taken place in our past and God has dealt with it and you have dealt with it. And it's time for you to say no to the accuser of the brethren who keeps accusing you for all that stuff. Because he's delivered you and redeemed you. It's good news. It's good news for you and it's good news for me. Now watch. Luke, um, well, I gotta get there. Luke 22. All right. Verse 31. All right. Verse 28. You are those who have stood by me in my trials. And just as my Father has granted me a kingdom, I grant you that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. In verse 31, he says, he looks at Simon, he says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. Do you, do you know that you can fall and your faith doesn't fail? Do you know that? I mean, he's going to say, listen, I'm going to sift you like wheat. Now listen, sifting like wheat is not a bad thing. When you, get, when you sift wheat, you get rid of what? The chaff. And if you're a wheat farmer or if, you, if you're a, a person um, who mills flour, you don't want chaff. And so when they sift the wheat, they take the wheat and back in those days and they throw that wheat up in the wind and um, the chaff would blow away and the wheat would fall down. And the chaff, the bad stuff, the, the extra stuff that's not good, it just, it just drifts away. And, and this is kind of what he's saying. He said, look, I'm about to pick you up and I'm going to throw you in the wind. And you're going to be sifted. Let me ask you if God asks you, if God said that, he was going to do that for you? Did you hear what I just said? If God said he was going to do that for you. <laughs> that's, that's not to you. But he would do that for you and for me. To be sifted. Sifting is a good thing. It gets the junk out. Just like fire is a good thing. Can be a good thing. When it purifies the gold and the silver, it gets the dross out. And it may be painful, and it may be hurtful, and it may be a struggle, and it may be a trial, but guess what? Every one of us who've had that trial, every one of us who's looked behind us and saw the trial, and even when we fell in the trial, that God did something marvelous out of it. Because that's what he does. He takes the chaff out. And so he says... I, 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 Satan has demanded me to sift you like wheat. And um, I've prayed for you. I've interceded for you. And I'm praying that your faith will not fail. And you, now watch this, and you, when once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. But he said to him, Lord, with you I'm ready to go both to prison and to death. And he said, I say to you, Peter, the rooster will not crow today until you have denied three times that you know me. It's going to happen. You're going to mess up. I'm, I'm reminded of, the, of the, 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 the scripture in 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. I mean, when you look at that scripture on, on the screen, will it come on the screen? Um, 
Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. I I was kind of looking at this passage of Scripture this week and just kind of mulling it over. I I want to tell you this. I don't think there's anything wrong with thinking that you're standing in Jesus. You just need to take heed that you don't fall. (laughs) Thinking that you're in Jesus is a good thing. It's believing that you're in Jesus and that you're standing in him and you're counting on the promises of God. There's, There's nothing wrong with that. But when it gets to the place that you think that you can do this on your own and in your own strength and that you've got this together and you don't acknowledge God with it and who God is in it. Because I want to tell you, there's some, sometimes we go through seasons that we're just really prideful people. We think we got it all, all together. And you're the only one who thinks that you, don't, you, you got it all together because everybody else sees that you don't. <laughs> right? It's that time when you think you got it all together and that you can handle this. Yes, you can handle it only by the strength of the Lord Jesus Christ and the grace that he gives to you. So I depend upon it. So let him who thinks he stands, I I think I'm standing right now. I'm seeking God. I'm I'm wanting the best for for him. I, I, I think that, but I need to take heed that I don't fall, that I trust him in the moment that I trust him for all that I am and all that God's done and all that God's given to me, that it's him, it's him that I praise, it's him that I glorify. You know, the Bible says in this last verse in Matthew that we just saw that he remembered what the Lord said. He said that you'd fall. He said that you'd fall. And he did. And, um, but there's something else that he needed to remember. And something that you and I need to remember. We need to remember redemption's promises. You know, the promise is this. You're going to be sifted, but I'm praying for you. Watch this. He doesn't say if you return. He says when you return, strengthen your brothers. This is the restoration power of God. You know, this is the promise that wherever I am, if I'm in Christ, wherever I am, God's at work and he's going to finish this work. Notice what he says in Philippians 1.6. I'm confident on on the screen of this very thing that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 5.21, faithful is he who calls you and he who will bring it to pass. Romans 11.29, the gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable. He doesn't take them back. Isaiah 44.22, I've wiped out your transgression like a a thick cloud and your sins like a heavy mist. Return to me. I've redeemed you. I've forgiven you. Return to me. And I'll tell you, and when you return to him, you have the full benefits of the household of God. Not a second class citizen. Not a black sheep of the family, so to speak. You are in great standing with our great God. And this is what he's going to do with Peter. He's going to restore him. So I, I, want you to go, I want you to go to, oh, oh I, I want to say this. In verse 34 of this passage, of, of, of the, the passages is that he goes out and he weeps, and he weeps bitterly, okay? And so I want to talk just in the last three or four minutes with you. I want you to turn to John 21, and I want you to think about these, these two things that I want to leave with you. Um, Peter falls, when the redeemed falls, because we're redeemed, there's a great restoration. Okay. There's a great restoration. And I really believe this restoration begins in this passage in Luke when he, when he weeps bitterly. The Bible says that we are to have a godly sorrow over our sin. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10 um, on the screen says that the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Have you ever, hey, let me say something to these young, younger folks here, and, and some of us who, have you ever been to youth camp? How many of you been to youth camp? Yeah, raise your hand. Look, oh, wow. Oh, have you been to youth camp? Remember on decision night? I mean, I'm, I'm saying this as a youth pastor and as a former youth. Okay, okay. I'm telling you, there's sometimes on that last night or the night, the first night, I've seen my youth group, I've seen them go to the altar and weep like newborns. 
and weep and weep and weep. Gather them up, talk about what's going on. And, um, and man, they're good, they're doing good now. And within two weeks, they're back in the pit. You ever seen that? Have you ever experienced that? And then I've had youth who didn't shed a tear, but they had this godly sorrow, a sorrow not according to the world, but a sorrow according to God. And they were forever changed. So you can be sorry about a whole lot of things. When you're sorrowful with a godly sorrow, it will produce a repentance, watch this, without regret. Without regret that you're changing your life, but also without even the regret of where you've been. I mean, that's how clean and how great God is. But I weep over my sin, or I, or I, 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 I may not weep literally, but I have this sorrow in my heart of who I have, have been and what I've done and what I've done to people. And that produces a repentance. What is repentance? Repentance is I'm walking one way and I stop and I go the other way. I'm walking my walk, I'm walking the enemy's walk, I'm under him, I'm responding in all kinds of evil ways or ungodly ways and I stop, I give my life to Christ, I repent, I turn, I change my mind, I change my heart and you know what else? God comes and changes my behavior. <laughs> That's what repentance is. And I think that Peter has this. I mean, he has this, first of all, this thought that God has already told him, hey, you're gonna return, and when you return, strengthen your brothers. And he just doesn't come out with that. He weeps, and he weeps bitterly. Well, let me tell you what he does for Peter and what he does for you. John chapter 21. Jesus has died. He's rose again. He's already appeared to him twice. This is the third time he's appearing to them. And he finds Peter, and this is, it's a great story if you want to read it, but, uh, but look at verse, look at verse uh, 15. So when they finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now, I, I don't know what he was pointing to. He might have been pointing to the rest of the disciples. He might have been pointing to the fish. I mean, I, I know people who love the fish more than they love God. They do. I, I know people who love their boats and their stuff and their things and their jobs more than they love God. Do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than these folks love me? That's what he says to him. He says, you know that I love you, Lord. He said to him, tend my lambs. And he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, shepherd my sheep. And he said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved to him because he said to him, watch this, the third time, not a third time, the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. Now, let me, let me just say this. In, in this little discourse, when Jesus says, do you love me, he uses the word agape. Do you love me with a godlike love the same kind of love that I loved you with that sent me to the cross that I died for you. And Peter's saying, yeah, yeah, I, I, I love you, but I, I phileo you. And phileo is the word for affectionate love, friendship love. Philadelphia, the city of what? Brotherly love. Okay. Simon, son of John, do you agape me more than these? Lord, I phileo you. I, I don't love you like you love me. I'm not there yet. I've just denied you three times. And what does Jesus say? Tend my lambs. Feed my sheep. I always say this. When God's at work in your life after the redeemed have fallen, he's quickly wanting to restore you to himself and he's also wanting to restore you to the assignment that God's given to you. Amen? I mean, this happened pretty quick, don't you think? I mean, he's just, he's just fallen royally, greatly. And God's saying, listen, yeah, you don't love me with agape love right now. You phileo me, okay. Feed my sheep. 
You know what's interesting? When, when Peter is sitting around before this scene, he tells the guys, I'm going back to fishing. <laughs> and I think guys say, oh, no, 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 no. I told you that you follow me, I'm gonna make you fishers of men. You'll no longer be fishing for fish, okay? And I, and I think my personal opinion is that he's going back fishing. He's done, he, he's disqualified. He can't, he's no longer worthy. Have you ever felt that? Disqualified, no longer worthy. I, and, and you know what, God says, wait, wait, time out. Do you love me? God, I, I phileo you. Well, guess what? I'll take you right where, right there. Right there, I'll take you. Simon, son of John, do you agape me? Lord, you know that I phileo you. Shepherd my sheep. He doesn't just say, hey, take the oats out and give them food, but shepherd them. Take care of my sheep. Listen, listen to this. This is a guy that fell, fell greatly, and just a couple of weeks later, he's entrusting him back to the sheepfold. Isn't that great? Amen. Amen. Hey, listen, listen. Those who, who know they've been forgiven much, love much. <laughs> and that's what qualifies you. That's what qualifies you. Third time. Simon, son of John, do you phileo me? Uh-oh. Do you phileo? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you phileo me? He's grieved. It's like he says, oh God, you know I don't agape you, but you know I phileo you. Please, Lord, please don't question that. I love you like that. I love you like a brother. I have this affection for you. I love you. And he always says, what does he say? Shepherd my sheep. Feed my sheep. Look at the very next verse. See, God, I just like, like on the point, God places you back where you belong. His calling and his gift to the redeemed is not irrevocable. And so he places you back where you belong. And then what he does is he positions you to glorify him. Now no, watch. Verse 18. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and you used to walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and they will bring you to a place you do not wish to go. And he said this signifying but what, by what kind of death he would glorify God. Now, let me, let me just say, say this. He's saying, he's, he's making a, a, a prophetic word here that's going to happen. One day you're going to be able to say, I agape you. And I'll stretch out my hands. Maybe it's this way because they, they, they tie him up and they lead him to a place he doesn't want to go. His flesh doesn't want to go. I mean, come on, I, I don't, I don't want to hang on a cross. But I'll stretch out your hands and you'll die for me. You'll be able to say one day, I agape you. I want to say this. If you're part of the redeemed, this is where God's bringing us. He's bringing us to a place of love that we're willing to lay down our life whenever, whatever, however. Even if it means drawing our own blood and dying a martyr's death. Christians are doing that all over the world. Their hands are being stretched out and they're being taken to a place flesh doesn't want to go. But they're glorifying God. I, I want to ask, how important is it for you to glorify God? See, when Peter dies on, the, on, on a cross, and this is what history tells us. You don't get this from the word, but there's a historian that says that when they crucified him, they crucified his wife first. And while she was dying, he just kept saying, remember the Lord. Just remember the Lord. Can you imagine? And they took him and he said, I, I'm not worthy to die the same way. Again, this is history. And so they said, okay, we'll just hang you upside down. So they nailed him to a cross and hung him upside down. And he died for the glory of God. Martyred. Agape in Jesus as his soul departed. I'm going to tell you this. As your pastor, this is what I believe God wants to do in every one of our lives. I'm not saying that every one of us is going to die 
for, his, for our faith. But I want, us, I want us to get to this place. And I think about this all the time. I think about, gosh, where are we, Lord? Where are we in our faith? And God, are we moving toward this Christ-likeness that we are continuing to love you more and more so that it's not just this affection that we have for God. It is the agape love of God that will take us to places that are grand and great in the schemes of heaven. This is what restoration looks like. It's the promise that says, hey, you're going to get there. You're going to get there. I'm going to get you there. And I want to ask you, church, will you believe this? Now, you know, Peter just had to open his mouth one more time. And that, I mean, he just does. He just keeps. When well, you know what he says? They look at John and they say, what about him? What, 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 what about him? See, we, we have this tendency to compare ourselves with other people, right? Where we are spiritually, where they are spiritually. Oh, they're just too great. I can't even touch that. Oh, they're so rotten. They can't touch me, right? Always comparing. Don't compare. And, and he says, well, what about him? And he said, hey, what if I want him to stay alive until I come back again? What's that to you? And this is what he says. Just follow me. Just follow follow me. In Luke chapter, fifth, uh, chapter 5, there was another scene three years earlier. They let down their nets for a catch after catching nothing all night. And in the end of that conversation, in that scene, Jesus said, hey, don't fear. From now on, you'll be catching men. Follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. And they left their nets and they left their boats and they followed him. And he did. He followed him. And then he fell. When the redeemed fall, listen to me. I read this in Bible study Thursday morning. Seven o'clock, Beans and Franks. Men, it's a great Bible study. We're in Galatians. Galatians chapter five. If someone gets caught in a trespass, those who are spiritual are to restore the one that has fallen. I want to say this. Let's be about the restoration work of God. Because I want to tell you, the disciples could have criticized him, been critical of him, could have judged him. John could have said, hey, you're comparing you with me. I'm the one that's went all the way to the cross with him. No, no condemnation. But we'll seek, let me tell you this, when you fall, or if you fall, I want to tell you, we are available to walk with you, to see you restored. I just want to tell you that. That's what redemption is all about. Bow with me in prayer. Would you do that? Let me ask you the first question. Where have you been? Where have you been spiritually? Have you been in the, di have you been in the ditch? Have you been in the, in the pit? Uh, where have you been? Well, I want to say this. Will you cry out to God today? And would you see that this, this great passage of Scripture, this great restoration of God, that when the redeemed fall, God always comes back and lifts the redeemed out of the pit to restore them and redeem them. You say, how many times? 70 times 7? Is that? Let's just start there. 70 times 7? Yeah, let's just start there. If you're redeemed... This is what we have to look forward to. The redemptive work of God, the forgiveness of our sins, the cleansing of our sins, the cleansing of our life, and restoration to him always. If you're the redeemed. Now I want to ask the question, are you the redeemed today? Has Jesus, have you invited Jesus into your life? Have you heard the word of God and responded to him by faith? To give your life to him, to change, to repent, to turn, and to say, oh God, I'm not going to walk my walk anymore. I'm going to walk your walk. I'm going to walk your way. I'm not going to do it my way. I'm going to live God's way. It's like Zayden did the other night, other day. When he accepted Christ, I'm not going to walk my way anymore. I'm going to walk God's way. I'm going to receive him into my life and live in him and believe what he did 2,000 years ago. He did just for me so that I might be the redeemed of God. I might be the redeemed of God. I'm going to ask you a question. Are you the redeemed of God? You may be here today and you might say, I don't know if I'm the redeemed of God.
but I want to be the redeemed of God. I want to tell you this. First of all, there'll be some people up here ready to talk to you, okay? They're going to be ready to talk to you about redeeming. I'm going to ask the Rutledges today and um, Guy and Cindy, just if you'd be up here um, right after. Craig and Deb, if you'd be right up here right after, would you all do that? And just be available to visit with you for anything that you need. And they'll be right up here, and you can um, visit with them and talk with them, and they'll show you what it means to redeem, be redeemed. If you just need some prayer, they'll pray for you. Now, here, here's, here's what I just want to close. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he climbed to me, and he heard my cry. And he pulled me out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay. He put my feet on the rock. He made my footsteps firm, and he put a new song in my mouth. A song of praise to our God. If you're here today as a redeemed person, I hope your heart is, and, you're, and you've, been, you've been wandering somewhere else, your prayer would be right there. Oh, God, I want the new song back. I want the new walk back. I want it back, and I want it today. These folks will talk to you. Now, Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for what you've done. I thank you for how you're moving. I thank you that we're the redeemed children of God, and that, Father, fallen as we are, we are headed to one, one place, and that's to be like Jesus. And that's why you take the redeemed who have fallen, and you restore them. There's such great hope today, Lord. And I pray that we walk in that hope, and that we'd walk in it from this point on. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.